Hello and welcome to our ISTAS panel. My name is Katina Michael. I'm a professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society in the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence at Arizona State University. And today with me, I have Matt Winnier, Maxwell Melman, and Sarah Gerg. Welcome, everyone. Good morning or good evening. I guess it depends on where you are right now. I, I think it's somewhere near close to 1 a.m. my time in Sydney, Australia, but um, <laughs> I am Goodness. as chirpy as ever to be with the three of you. And today, uh, our session was to be chaired by the wonderful Kenneth Foster. Um, Kenneth uh, is renowned for many diverse skill sets, uh, but one article that did pique my attention that's highly relevant is this one. RFID inside the murky ethics of implanted chips. And Kenneth wrote that with Jan Jager. And interestingly, this 2007 article in Spectrum was reviewed by me and another one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Christine Paraxlis, but it piqued my attention. Of course, Kenneth uh, has worked many, many years in biomedical devices, uh, but also in wireless and uh, has huge interest in that space and was a long-term professor uh, at Penn Engineering. So uh, while Kenneth can't be with us right this moment, I think he's tuned in from somewhere, but we'll proceed because we're going to talk about uh, an area that we've been working together on uh, that I think we have DARPA to thank uh, for bringing us together. And uh, I know I've enjoyed your company and learned so much uh, over the last, has it been two years, folks? I think at least a year and a half. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, these bursty projects that DARPA put together um, and uh, very intense with program management. They, they have skeletal staff. They only have about 120 full-time employees working at DARPA and the rest are contractors that help things to get going. But it's, it's a... a you know, fundamental applied research and fundamental basic research, uh, pure research coming together uh, to do these amazing projects. And they've asked us to come on board uh, as an ELSI panel. Um, would someone like to have a go at explaining to our audience what an ELSI panel actually is? What an ELSI panel like ours is? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, well, uh, uh, not to be facetious, but I liken it to organ donation, uh, or organ transplantation. Uh, everybody makes a fortune except the uh, donors. So we're the donors. Um, we are unpaid, uh, and uh, uh, but we are uh, selected presumably because of our backgrounds um, in bioethics uh, and in technology uh, uh, ethics and also in military uh, ethics. Uh, and uh, Sarah, in my case, uh, also uh, our, our knowledge of the law uh, as it applies. And we advise, um, uh, uh, in this case, uh, DARPA, um, uh, but all of us, I think, have uh, been on other advisory uh, missions for uh, the Department of Defense and related uh, related organizations uh, involved with military bioethics. Um, I was uh, on one just a, a year or so ago for a couple of years, uh, which was uh, introducing uh, the first predictive genetic testing in the military. Uh, and I was now with the bioethicist who was um, uh, so, you know, who was advising that group. Um, so uh, it's a, it's interesting. Um, um, we are, I think, um, I, I, I think it's fair to say we are listened to, uh, we are taken seriously, and that's really a very, uh, you know, it, that's very rewarding um, so that we can play a good role. Anyone got anything to add on, on previous I will things? Add, yes, I would only I would only add that I think these are becoming increasingly common um, as folks in the research and military environments um, start to see and recognize the ethical, Kenneth? legal, and social implications of the work no, that they're okay. doing. You were saying? No, I was just saying that I think these are becoming increasingly common, and so you know if there are folks out there who end up listening to this and are and are doing work that has ethical and social and legal implications, um, this may be a mechanism for uh, ensuring that as you move forward with that work, as you develop the work, as you implement, as you disseminate, um, that you uh, maintain a sort of an awareness of the ways in which others may see the work or interpret the work. We'll talk more about this, I think, as we go along this morning or this evening. It's interesting. Or the middle of the night. <laughs> or the middle of the night as, here in Australia. As the case may be in Australia. <laughs> well, I think more and more, Matt, you're right. And Max, uh, 
they're not letting these big projects go through without ethicists or legal right. specialists, sociologists, uh, medical professionals, medical ethicists, uh, bioethicists, the list goes on, uh, because this is the, the new complexity that we're living in. This, mm -hmm. this interplay, this interconnection of different disciplines that are converging now to offer breakthrough technologies. And uh, that's what we're preoccupied with, uh, a so-named breakthrough technology, though implants have been around since we've had different types of medical implants and perhaps more advanced than the one that we're studying. And while we're under non-disclosure agreement, we can't really talk about the technical uh, aspects of uh, ADAPTA. Uh, we can actually share what our perspectives are and uh, what's in the public domain, of which there is a lot in the public domain. So if anyone's really interested in learning about ADAPTA, just Google it and uh, you, you, you'll find out um, a great deal about it. Uh, but increasingly, we are seeing uh, academia uh, merge with industry, uh, converge with government, converge with military, and trying to come together uh, to a more holistic awareness of a, of a particular problem space, um, because this space is so complex. There are so many interdependencies. Um, Sarah, what have you found from your research? Yeah, I, 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 I do a lot of AI research, and um, I, I just got two new projects which are funded by the European Union. And uh, there was also a, an, a requirement that there is someone with ethics and legal ex, um, expertise. So I do see right now that um, also the NIH, uh, et cetera, that wherever you are trying to get funding for developing new technology, um, uh, funders have realized that this ethics and the legal component is very important. And so working in an LC group, and I think uh, moving forward, we will we are going to see this more and more in, in the new technology uh, field um, that interdisciplinarity is very important. And as you already mentioned, Katina, I guess it's just because it's such a complex uh, uh, field and it's that we do need different minds to work on it, to tackle it. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think what we might do is uh, now that we have a definite audience, uh, we can verify that both in the Zoom and uh, on TownScript, uh, we might just give a, a short introduction. I'll do that on Adapter just to get people uh, aware of what we're actually uh, preoccupied with over these last one and a half years. Start off with uh, a few caveats. So the first is that none of us uh, are employees of the Department of Defense or the US government and the views presented are not the views of DARPA today or the Department of Defense or the US government. Further, the activities are not endorsed, sponsored or promoted by DARPA, DOD or the US government. So these are our personal uh, views and in no way reflect on DARPA. So this is the ADAPTER project, everyone. Uh, this is the icon or the picture that's used to depict ADAPTER internally and externally. And ADAPTA stands for the Advanced Acclimation and Protection Tool for Environmental Readiness. It's a program located within DARPA's Biological Technologies Office. And ADAPTA aims to develop a travel adapter for the human body, an implantable or an ingestible bioelectronic carrier that contains cellular factories and compounds, that is therapies, to be released upon secure external uh, activation. Now, imagine a soldier on deployment having the command and control to trigger a release of therapies to prevent particular conditions in their own body. The system is designed to either entrain the sleep cycle, halving the time to reestablish normal sleep after a disruption, for example, jet lag, or to eliminate the top five bacterial sources of traveler's diarrhea. Consider a remote control capability to wellness and recovery. Adapter is a way to physically interface with the human body a type of wireless living pharmacy via an implantable device that attempts to control the body's circadian clock, aiding to regulate cycles by providing accurate diagnostics and response mechanisms. So say, for example, uh, you know, I uh, am changing shifts. I undergo shift lag. Well, this will help us uh, to overcome the shift lag. Say, for example, I land in another country. Uh, I'm not feeling so well. I eat something or I'm exposed to bacteria. Uh, by another, uh, this helps us to recover quickly uh, from traveler's diarrhea. Well, that's the theory anyhow. On the next slide, uh, we have here DARPA's adapter implantable to, as I said, help overcome jet lag and traveler's diarrhea to enhance soldier performance. 
And here we have a programming device. Here we have the actual uh, cellular therapies that are being emitted. And here we are hoping uh, to uh, achieve those two goals, better sleep cycles and quicker having the time to jet lag. For example, if we move across time zones like we are today, or maybe I'd like one of these today, uh, given what time it is here, but uh, you get the picture. So operational scenarios for implantables are generally gaining momentum in the medical and non-medical spaces, right? So right now, what would you put this as, a, a medical or a non-medical space? Is it really uh, a medical device or is it going to be just like another Fitbit? So with the rapid growth of the prosthetic market, like insulin pumps, citizenry have become more accustomed to hearing about people who bear biomedical devices. So once upon a time, if someone uh, was insulin, insulin dependent, uh, potentially, you know, oh, you'd be shocked to hear that they had an implantable insul insulin pump. Well, not so much these days. And so if someone just says to you, look, you know, I have shift work, uh, you know, I'm day shift and I'm afternoon shift and I'm night shift and it's doing my head in, I've just received an implant. Uh, perhaps within the next five years, 10 years, that may not be such a big of a deal, especially when we look at more sophisticated devices like deep brain stimulators, vagus nerve stimulators, and a whole bunch of other things coming onto the market now through the FDA's approval. So it shouldn't surprise us that government agencies like DARPA are heavily considering what the future might hold and soliciting proposals from cross-disciplinary technical research teams to ponder on one possible socio-technical imaginary a future where implants tethered to smartphones are commonplace and not the exception, but the norm. In many ways, this imaginary, the feedback loops between humans and machines, preoccupied the great Norbert Wiener. And what we have now through his mindfulness is a manner by which to ponder the possibilities. We cannot rule out anything, but at the same time, we have to be sober in our analysis in what might be and perhaps what should be. So let's take a, a deeper look here. Uh, at the end train implant, which in this instance depicts this image uh, and inter internal cellular factories, which when activated by light, produce precisely dosed peptide therapies. The device keeps the cellular factories tightly enclosed, only allowing the therapies to diffuse into the body. And this is, of course, courtesy of Northwestern University, a public image uh, cited here with the Amanda Morris implantable living pharmacy could control body sleep wake cycles. So adapter is multi-application and multifunctional. It uses an integrated system to house a variety of biosensors that will be diagnostic and interventionist, disrupting the typical medical supply chain that is lengthy in preparation and delivery. It will provide just-in-time antibiotic production and will be wholly embedded and performed in vivo. Adapter will allow for toxin removal from ingested resources and will provide the soldier on deployment with the ability to quickly acclimatize due to time zone differences the body is unmistakably exposed to after long haul travel, such as shift lagged and jet lagged, and what may come of that. So there's two main things here. The two priorities uh, for the military that have been identified in adapter include number one, and training the sleep cycle either to a new time zone or back to a normal sleep pattern after night missions. And number two, eliminating bacteria that cause travelers diarrhea from contaminated food and water, perennial challenge for militaries noted as far back as the Peloponnesian War. Adapta is not about altering the genetics of the human body, but working with the body to provide transient enhancement and extension of warfighter readiness. In this figure, we see how this will work in a proof of concept using an edge device, an external hub. You can see that over the person's uh, tricep, interfacing with the normalizing timing and rhythms across internal networks of circadian clocks, the N-train implant that stands for. Each transponder implant has a unique ID that will come with enough storage capacity to contain an encryption key for secure data transfer. It is believed that the implant will be embedded during an outpatient procedure into the subdermal layer and the insertion site will be the tricep of the individual. The chip will be triggerable by the battery powered hub attached to an external form factor like a wearable armband that you can see here depicted or even luggable smartphone. The hub will receive and transmit signals while tethered to a smartphone using a dedicated app. This is just one of several operational scenarios. In-body device communicates with on-body hub that are plausible for the future of implants previously described. And I could use my own phone, for example, uh, to link with that tethered external hub and perhaps update things. 
Um, I'd like to suggest also see BlackRock Systems, Microsystems, a privately held company that provides enabling tools for neuroscience, neural engineering, and neuroprosthetics research worldwide, as they are also partners on this project. So as we've previously noted, um, we're going to go through three areas today. The ethics, the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. Here we're talking about moral codes, morality, moral principles, values, rights and wrongs, ideals, creeds, ethos, rules of conduct, behavior, and some of those are depicted here on the right. We're going to talk about laws, the system of rules which a particular country or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and which it may enforce by the imposition of penalties. Here we're talking about rules, regulations, systems of laws, bodies of laws, constitutions, legislation, codes, legal codes, charter, jurisprudence, soft laws, technical standards, guidelines, and here on the right, some examples. But the question is whether soldiers have their own special laws uh, within the military, and we'll get to that later. And finally, of course, what does social mean in this context when we look at ELSI? Well, it's relating to society or its organization. It's about being communal, community, community-based, collective. It's a group. It's general. It's popular. It's civil. It's civic. It's public. It's societal. It's organized, civilized. Does a soldier receiving an implant actually affect the rest of civil society? That's a question we might ask and pose each other. And here on the right, these important terms such as dignity, freedom, autonomy, that I know Sarah will probably touch on many times over. So this interconnection of the ethics, the law, and the, so the social. And here are the US warfighters and outside our socio-technical system, perhaps the aliens. They may well be family members of the warfighters or may well be aliens to the country of origin where these devices have been adopted. But increasingly, we're seeing, as we said, the need for people to come on board these ELSI panels with diverse backgrounds. In our panel, we have a member from Bioethics, Bioethics and Humanities, Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics, Public Interest Technology, Engineering and Innovation. Uh, here we have the interdisciplinary teams that are working on this project, Northwestern University, Rice, University of Minnesota, Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Utah, MIT, Stanford University, and of course, BlackRock Microsystems. Uh, about 86% of the members on the team, uh, of these teams, these interdisciplinary teams within engineering are male and about 14% were female uh, based off the original kickoff uh, meeting plan. And truly we're dealing with a black box here. Um, there's an input, there's a transformation that occurs, uh, whether that's the peptides being released or it's some other uh, ingestible mechanism, uh, and you have output. Then you observe a change in state and then you do it again. But this black box uh, is renowned uh, for not only observation but experiment, and we've seen it in many different fields. And Sarah mentioned artificial intelligence. There may well be layers of this in the future within black boxes like the implantables we're talking about today. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, and pass on uh, to our next speaker, uh, and we'll go from there. So, so today I thought I will give you a little bit of an overview of privacy laws in the US and, and Europe, um, because if we are developing this technology, a lot of data um, is necessarily being involved, uh, and so also the collection of sensitive data. And so what will be very important is that manufacturers and AI developers, but also in general digital health developers will think about those issues upfront rather than later and really think about what uh, kind of um, potentially privacy laws uh, will be applicable and relevant. And, um, and that's also uh, for the military um, context. So I thought I will talk a little bit first uh, about U the US law, and we do have there the US Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and then I will uh, look at Europe and analyze and show you a little bit about the EU General Data Protection Regulation, and then going back to um, new developments and recent legal developments in the US at the state level and talk a little bit about the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, so let's start with HIPAA. So HIPAA uh, is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act uh, in the US, um, and especially its privacy rule is really the key 
federal law to protect health data privacy in the US. Um, uh, but uh, there is an issue with HIPAA because it does have significant gaps uh, when it comes to today's uh, healthcare environment because it only covers protected health information generated by covered entities or their business associates. So what does that mean? So protected health information is in general um, individually identifiable health information and HIPAA covered entities uh, include health plans, healthcare clearinghouses and also healthcare providers who transmit health information electronically uh, in connection with particular transactions. So that means that also, for example, military clinics or hospitals um, or most uh, providers uh, are HIPAA covered entities. Um, and then business associates, that is a person or an entity that performs these fun certain functions and activities. So for example, uh, data processing or analysis on behalf of um, the covered entity uh, that involves the use or disclosure of uh, protected health information. So individually identifiable health information. But what this means is that HIPAA does not cover health information generated by entities not covered by HIPAA. Uh, so in particular, much of the health information collected, collected by technology giants, yeah, such as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, um, all kind of tech companies are usually not considered covered entity, um, entities and so, so fall outside of HIPAA. Um, but um, I need to say that in at least in some cases, uh, HIPAA covered entities um, such as healthcare providers, hospitals, uh, use the activities or services of companies uh, such as Google and then share protected health information with them. And in these cases, the tech companies are considered business associates under HIPAA. And then a business associate agreement between the parties will then typically contain appropriate safeguards on the use and disclosure of the shared individually identifiable health information. Mm, uh, a different problem with HIPAA is its reliance on de-identification as a privacy strategy. So when, for example, hospitals share data with technology companies such as Google and Co, they often make sure that the data is uh, de-identified. Uh, and de-identified um, uh, health information can be shared freely uh, for research and commercial purposes. Um, and de-identification is usually being done by the removal of 18 identifiers such as names, social security numbers, biometric identifiers, et cetera, um, of the individual or also of rela uh, relatives, household members, or employers of the individual. And then also the covered entity does not have actual knowledge that that information could be used to identify the individual. Uh, but HIPAA uh, still may not adequately protect the privacy of patients because of the problem of data triangulation. So a person may be de-identified as to one data set, but then the data may be easily re-identified through the combination of another available data set. Uh, so for example, since Google has easy access to other information, uh, so, such as Google uh, Maps, uh, re-identification is uh, not very difficult in most cases. And so it's also not surprising uh, that this problem has already been picked up by a lawsuit, uh, Dynastein versus Google, uh, in which the plaintiff alleged that the University of Chicago Medical Center shared medical records with Google containing enough information that enable uh, Google to potentially re-identify patients giving all of its other data at hand. Uh, but this lawsuit was dismissed um, by a federal judge in Illinois on the grounds uh, that Matt Dynastein did not demonstrate damages. And so this case also demonstrates the challenges uh, of pursuing claims against hospitals that share patient data uh, with tech giants such as Google. So for all these reasons explained, many people believe these days that HIPAA is actually insufficient to protect the health privacy of patients in the big data world. Uh, but, juris uh, but there are other uh, jurisdictions that have implemented other regulatory designs, such as the OOF. So the GDPR uh, has been applied since um, 25th May of 2018 in all EU member states and really introduced a new era of data protection law in the EU. In total, uh, the GDPR consists of 11 chapters and 99 articles. So it's a very long document. Uh, I listed here some of the relevant provisions with regard uh, to data concerning health. Uh, 
Um, I don't have enough time to give uh, a very detailed overview, but at least I want to highlight a few uh, things. So first of all, the GDPR applies to the processing of personal data wholly or partly by automated means and to the processing other than by automated means of personal data which form part of a filing system or are intended to form part of a filing system. So the term personal data is important and it's defined in the GDPR as any information relating to an identified or an identifiable natural person, it's, and the so-called data subject. And processing is any operation or set of operation which is performed on personal data or on sets of personal data. Uh, whether or not by automated means. So that is uh, a collection, storage, use, etc. Uh, and the GDPR also covers data concerning health, which is personal data related to the physical or mental health of a natural person, including the provision of healthcare services, which reveal information about his or her health status. And the EU's GDPR is a lot broader in its scope compared to US HIPAA which only covers, uh, as mentioned, specific health information generated by covered entities or their business associates. Uh, I also want to highlight uh, that the GDPR has an extreme broad territorial scope. So under Article 3.1, um, the GDPR generally applies to the processing of personal data in the context of the activities of an EU establishment of a controller or a processor irrespective of whether the processing takes place within or outside the EU. And um, controllers and processors can be uh, legal or natural persons, agencies, public authorities, or other bodies. And the difference between the two is that controllers uh, determine the means and purposes of the processing of personal data, and then the processors process personal data on the controller's behalf. So the GDPR may also have implication for US companies, um, so for example. So in particular, under Article uh, 3, Section 2, the GDPR applies to the processing of personal data of data subjects who are in the EU by a non-EU establishment of a controller or a processor, where the processing activities are related to uh, either the offering of good or services paid or free. So that could be newspaper uh, or affiliated websites, to such data subjects in the EU. And then the second one, which is uh, very relevant in our context, is the monitoring of the data subjects behavior taking place within the EU. So what this means is that the GDPR can not only apply to an EU establishment of a process or a controller, but also a non-EU establishment under certain circumstances. So for example, a company established in the US may be subject to the GDPR in cases where the company deliberately monitors health behavior of data subjects through smart devices in the EU. And then I would like to uh, highlight Article 9 of the GDPR. So Article 9 uh, of the GDPR the, uh, is uh, the processing of so-called special categories of personal data. Uh, that's including genetic data, biometric data, also data concerning health. And in general, uh, the processing of the, these special categories of personal data is prohibited. But Article 9, Section 2 of the GDPR contains a list of exceptions to this general ban. So, for example, uh, the prohibition uh, in Article uh, 9, Section 1 shall, usual, shall usually not apply in cases where uh, the data subject has given explicit consent for one or more specific purposes. Or, for example, also uh, where the processing is necessary for reasons of public interest in the area of public health. So, for example, the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic or for archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific or historical research purposes or statistical purposes which shall proportionate to the aim pursued, um, respect the essence of the right to data protection and also provide for suitable and specific measures to safeguard the fundamental rights and the interests of the data subjects. Um, under uh, Article 9, Section 4 of the GDPR, member states can also introduce further constraints concerning the processing of certain special categories of personal data, uh, such as uh, data concerning health. And it's also worth noting that non-compliance with the basic principles for processing um, under Article 9 uh, may result in administrative fines up to 20 million euros, uh, or if higher, up to 4% of an undertaking's annual global turnover over the pre, uh, of the previous year. 
and there are, have already been uh, um, cases and, uh, and, and fines, so that's not just theoretically, but it is happening if someone is in breach of uh, uh, this article. Um, then, um, uh, in, in general, if the GDPR applies, it also provides data subjects with multiple rights against controllers, such as the right to be informed, the right of access, the right to erasure is also called the right to be forgotten, and also the right to data portability. So um, going back uh, to uh, the US, so uh, while US HIPAA uh, preempts less protected states laws, it does not preempt states whose laws are more protective. And so what we are seeing right now um, in the US at the state level, that many states um, are, mm, are actually enacting their own small uh, little sisters or brothers of the GDPR. And one example is California um, that recently has taken action at the state level. Um, so the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, the CCPA, became effective in January 2020. And the CCPA grants various rights to California residents with regard to personal information that is held by businesses. And some of uh, the CCPA's provisions um, have also recently been amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, which will take effect in January 2023, and then further expands also the California consumer's uh, privacy rights. It's worth noting that the CCPA does not apply to protected health information that is collected by HIPAA-covered entities or their business associates, but it applies to a great deal of information in the so-called shadow health records. So that's the health data which is collected outside of the health system. And so the CCPA is a welcome attempt to at least partially fill in all the legal gaps and improve um, the data protection of individuals. Um, Virginia, Colorado, uh, and Utah, and also Connecticut have recently passed new comprehensive privacy laws as well. And several other states may enact new privacy laws uh, in the future. But again, what's important to point out is each of those state laws only apply to their uh, uh, residents. And so it's really depending on each individual in the United States where they are living, whether their uh, data privacy is properly protected right now. I stop here and hand it over, I think, to Max. Uh, so uh, good morning, yes, everyone, you. or good, good evening. Uh, wait, I'm, yes, you can hear me. Um, so uh, I'm uh, Professor Max Melman uh, at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, um, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the uh, adapter program, uh, ethical issues, um, uh, leave some law into it as well. Uh, I'm going to focus on the program's uh, jet lag device, although much of what I'm, I'll say also applies to uh, its other focus, which is uh, a device to uh, prevent traveler's diarrhea. Um, so I was asked to speak about the benefits and the risks of this device and how uh, bioethical principles uh, might address those benefits and risks. Um, so uh, in terms of benefit, um, there is a, a scientific advisory group to uh, the U.S. Department of Defense called JSON. Uh, and in 2008, uh, they wrote an, uh, a report uh, on human performance. And one of the most interesting uh, um, uh, portions of this report uh, was uh, their uh, comments on the importance of uh, attending to sleep deprivation. So they said the most immediate human performance factor in military effectiveness is degradation of performance under stressful conditions, particularly sleep deprivation. They went on to say any method for improving how soldiers behave under sleep deprivation will have significant consequences for either our own forces or an adversary that learns to solve this problem. Um, and the, this report uh, identified uh, um, addressing sleep deprivation as the single most important uh, focus of uh, improving warfighter performance, more important than, uh, um, you know, perform uh, than enhancement, uh, uh, other forms of enhancement, uh, even uh, uh, exoskeletons and so forth. So really critical. Uh, if this can be addressed uh, successfully, uh, it can have a, uh, a major uh, effect on changing the result of uh, battlefield uh, of, 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 you know, of conflicts. Um, and that was their conclusion. So those are the benefits, tremendous benefits. Um, but of course, there are risks. 
So the active substance uh, in this jet lag device is melatonin. Um, and melatonin doesn't seem to present any serious acute safety effects. Uh, uh, one source uh, says that the LD50 for melatonin uh, couldn't be established. Um, the LD50 is the uh, dose uh, in uh, uh, typically in, in animals, mice, for example, uh, that where uh, uh, half of the of the animals that are given the uh, uh, the substance die. So that's a, a, a sort of generally accepted rubric for acute uh, uh, acute safety issues. And so the one source said we couldn't we couldn't find a an LD50 for melatonin. A later source did report an LD50 of 3.2 grams per kilo, sorry grams per kilogram, and that's about the same as table salt. So clearly not uh, presenting a, a significant acute health risk. Uh, now, might there be other acute health risks from the device? Well, that's one of the questions that the adapter program's research uh, is designed to answer. Um, other questions uh, 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 pertain more to chronic, potential chronic risks. So for example, could prolonged or repeated use of this device disrupt uh, the uh, warfighter's sleep cycle to the point that it would take a significant amount of time to reset that sleep cycle. Uh, that could be a problem. Uh, could the devices become habit forming? Uh, could warfighters become dependent on them? Uh, uh, now the device uh, is supposed to be controlled by the warfighter, uh, uh, but that raises the possibility that uh, uh, they might be able to figure out how to hack the device uh, and they might be able to use it uh, uh, more than they were supposed to or at higher dosages. Um, and so you may have heard of the uh, Belgian surgeon who reported a patient who was being treated with deep brain stimulation for depression, uh, and the patient would ratchet up the current on the rheostat uh, that he had control of to make him more upbeat at parties, said the doctor. Uh, so another risk uh, would be, obviously, if the device could be hacked by the enemy um, uh, and either uh, uh, you know, uh, disabled or uh, uh, you know, the dosage could be changed to uh, problematic uh, uh, dosages. Um, uh, presumably, this risk will be minimized by hardwiring and shielding uh, the signal from the controllers to the devices um, uh, and uh, adequately encrypting any wireless uh, communications. Uh, finally, uh, could the warfighter be, uh, depend on the device uh, to combat jet lag, uh, but the device malfunctions, uh, you know, technically malfunctions, and that could put them into a perilous situation. So the adapter program is embarking on a robust pro, uh, uh, pro, a program of preclinical and clinical research. So thinking about uh, clinical research, that is research with human subjects, you know, the rule in the military is uh, the same rule uh, as in civilian biomedical research, and that is that subjects in the military must give their informed consent to, uh, to participate uh, in biomedical research. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, service regulations in the United States uh, say that the, uh, the superiors uh, of potential subjects may not, quote, influence the decisions of their subordinates in any way, and indeed, they may not even be present when informed consent is being sought. So a very strict uh, regime uh, to uh, uh, protect uh, uh, you know, the informed consent process. Uh, the reason for these rules uh, was, uh, in part, historical abuses uh, in military experimentation. For example, uh, the uh, gas mustard lewisite gas experiments on GIs in World War II, um, the uh, Army LSD experiments in the late 1950s, uh, note the two individuals on the right who are laughing. Um, and then of course, the atomic radiation uh, exp uh, uh, experiments on troops in the 1950s, all of which were done without uh, obtaining the informed consent of the uh, individual subjects. Uh, so troops have to give their uh, informed consent to participate in research in the military, <coughs> excuse me, but they don't have to give their consent when uh, unapproved interventions are being given to them during deployment to uh, when, when uh, it's not just a research experiment, but it's uh, designed to provide them with operational benefits. Um, and this situation arose uh, with the distribution of uh, 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 pyridostigmine bromide and botulinum toxoid vaccine uh, to troops during the Gulf War, uh, and with the Department of Defense's anthrax vaccine immunization program, uh, which began in uh, 1998. And the primary objective of giving the troops uh, these uh, substances um, 
these uh, interventions, modalities, was to protect them against chemical and biological warfare, um, like the biological and chemical warfare uh, weapons that Saddam Hussein was supposed to have, but turned out, of course, he didn't. Um, PB was approved for myasthenia gravis, but not for protection against nerve agents, which is what it was being given to the war fighters uh, for. The T vaccine was produced by uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention under an experimental uh, investigational new drug exemption, i.e. was not approved, uh, uh, was not uh, fully approved. Uh, and as for the uh, Department of Defense's anthrax vaccine, um, the, uh, pro their program used a newer version of the vaccine uh, that had been approved by the FDA to protect against subcutaneous anthrax, but hadn't been approved to protect against the aerosolized exposure that the military anticipated. So the military was giving troops these products, if you will, off-label, and that is uh, for uses that had not been approved. So war fighters were not asked for, you know, to give their consent to take these, they were ordered to. And this raises questions about whether that is ethical. Uh, can they be required to uh, use an unapproved uh, biomedical intervention? Well, ultimately, Congress uh, stepped in, the U.S. Congress stepped in and authorized requiring warfighters to use these uh, products for unapproved purposes rather than uh, only with uh, their permission. So long as uh, a waiver of informed consent was issued by the U.S. president or under an emergency use authorization that was granted by the FDA during a national emergency. For example, EUAs were granted for the use of uh, many products during the COVID uh, pandemic. So the question then is, uh, when is it appropriate to order troops to take unapproved interventions? Well, if we're talking about civilian life, uh, you know, the guidelines would be those described in the uh, Belmont report, uh, beneficence, respect for persons, uh, or particularly autonomy and justice. So the question is, can these principles uh, govern the use of these jet lag devices by the military? Well, think about the principle of beneficence. You know, in civilian life, uh, it requires us to maximize the benefit to the individual and above all, do no harm. You know, and yet military service, you know, can impose a very real risk of harm on war fighters, you know, indeed a risk of almost certain death in some situations. And furthermore, beneficence in civilian life focuses on the well-being of the individual. Uh, but in the military, the military, the uh, well-being of the individual warfighter is not paramount. It can be sacrificed for the welfare of the state and to accomplish the mission. And above all, in the military, the welfare of the individual is subordinated to the welfare of one's comrades, particularly the members of one's unit. You know, a sense of how strongly warfighters feel about their comrades can be obtained by uh, how they relate to one member of their unit. Um, uh, this little fellow in the back uh, called Patbot, um, which is a robotic uh, device that can here has a camera, but can also have uh, uh, weapons mounted on it. Uh, so when a unit's Patbot gets destroyed in combat, it's not unusual for the members of its unit to send condolence letters to the manufacturer uh, and even to hold funerals uh, for the uh, robot, uh, complete with a 21-gun salute. So that gives you an idea of how important uh, the members of the unit are uh, to one another. Uh, and in addition, you know, a major aspect of respect for persons in civilian life is that competent individuals have to be given the autonomy to make decisions for themselves. Uh, but in the military, of course, there's little autonomy. Troops have to obey lawful orders. So we need new principles for the military. Uh, in place of beneficence, we need a, a principle uh, uh, which I call proportionality. Um, I'm not the person to invent this, but proportionality means that we can impose a risk on war fighters when it is first necessary in that there's no less risky alternative available to accomplish the objective. Furthermore, when the objective is a legitimate military objective. And finally, when the risk is outweighed by the benefits, including the benefit from achieving the legitimate military objective, uh, and the benefit to the warfighter uh, and her comrades, say, uh, from reducing the risk of injury. Note that we also have to consider risks to third parties, as well as risks to those who use the devices. So now that we've identified the appropriate principles, let's briefly apply them uh, to uh, this jet lag device. So the first question is, how safe does it have to be for it to be given to warfighters? And the answer is that it must be safe enough that the risks are proportional to the benefits. Um, the second uh, 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 principle 
um, is uh, the principle of, uh, of autonomy. Uh, we have to replace the principle of autonomy with paternalism. Uh, the, this uh, principle is recognized in civilian bioethics. Respect for persons requires us to protect the interests of uh, people who cannot protect themselves, for example, due to diminished capacity. Uh, in the military, the need for protection isn't due so much to diminished capacity, but for uh, to the warfighters' diminished freedom of action. Um, and in civilian life, the protectors can be all sorts of people, physicians, family members, legal guardians, judges, and so forth. In the military, paternalism, looking out for the interests of troops, is primarily the responsibility of their superiors. And finally, the third principle uh, in military bioethics is fairness. And this is analogous to the principle of justice in civilian bioethics. So fairness may sound like an odd principle in the military uh, in terms of exposure to risk. You know, after all, the risk of injury or death is hardly fair. It varies widely depending on the branch of service, rank, location, and job. I mean, somebody, for example, has to take point uh, in a combat operation. But nevertheless, uh, the principle uh, uh, applies in the military. For example, it would prohibit commanders from imposing risks on a subgroup of subordinates in a discriminatory fashion, uh, to, uh, to impose risks on personnel who are less able to bear them than others, such as physically weaker members of the unit, or as punishment for bad behavior. So to me, the key issue for requiring uh, troops to use a, 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 an unapproved jet lag device uh, in, de in a deployment setting is proportionality. The risks, uh, must, imposing the risks must be necessary, no less risky alternative to accomplish the mission, and the accomplishment of the mission is important enough to justify imposing those risks. So in terms of less risky alternatives, you know, if the alternative to ordering warfighters to use the device would be uh, to not plunge them into high-risk situations while they were still jet-lagged, but instead giving them, say, a day or two to rest, well, then the use of the device could raise ethical concerns, depending on how mag how serious those risks were. So one way to reduce the ethical concerns would be to have a rule that we would only deploy the device before it's fully approved when giving war fighters a day or two off would jeopardize an important mission. So I'll stop there uh, and thank you and look forward to any questions or comments. Thank you, Max. Um, I put my comments in the chat. Uh, it was a terrific, uh, terrific presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, thing. Um, so uh, my task today is to explore a little bit of um, an ethical challenge in the development of technology and research on it, um, which is the dual use uh, research challenge. And um, before I dive in, I, I want to be clear, because there are two quite distinct um, uses of this phrase, dual use. Um, so what I am not referring to are dual use tech or products that have both, because they have both commercial and military uses. Um, so things like commercial off-the-shelf products that are then used by the military or products that are developed for the military and then commercialized, you know, Tang, um, or products that are developed commercially and then get uh, tweaked in some way for military use. And there are um, ethical and pragmatic challenges about that type of dual use um, stuff and research into dual use um, products. That's actually not what I'm referring to today. What I'm referring to is what the US government has sometimes called dual use research of concern, um, which is research on uh, products or um, capabilities that are both uh, defensive and have offensive potential. So these are tech or information tools that can be used to improve an individual's health, to improve the well-being of the of the warfighter, but could also inadvertently or on purpose be um, be used or be seen as an offensive technology. So the same tech that could be used legitimately for human betterment could also be used um, as a as a device for terrorism. So there are a bunch of examples of these. The really obvious ones are uh, what are sometimes called gain of function research. We've seen uh, a lot of concern about this during the uh, COVID pandemic with the SARS-CoV-2 virus being you know, rapidly analyzed and the genome sequenced and um, looking at areas of the genome that may confer resistance against 
um, specific antiviral uh, agents, for example, or that might confer resistance against vaccines, um, gene transfer studies, studies that take um, a, a pathogen and create a powdered or aerosolized version, for example. Um, any work with agents of disease that have been eradicated from the world, um, so sm smallpox, the original SARS virus, um, that we don't see in human beings anymore. So any, any kind of work on those um, is considered to be dual use research. Also any work on uh, biosafety level four agents. So things like Ebola, Lhasa, Marburg, many of the uh, hemorrhagic fever viruses. Um, there's a, essentially a set of about 15 of these that are named. Um, and if you're doing work on any of those, um, it is automatically considered to be potentially dual use research. Then there are a lot of less obvious examples of things that um, are uh, intended only really for, uh, for defensive purposes that are intended only to help humanity, right? So um, vaccine development um, is really only intended uh, I would say ever to be of benefit to the, the broader world. But if you're developing a vaccine to an agent um, that is a bio uh, hazard, that is a, a biological warfare agent in its potential, um, you can imagine a, an adversary perceiving that your vaccine research is an offensive research program because what you're doing is protecting your own troops and leaving the others, uh, leaving your adversary's troops unprotected, that might allow you to use that agent as an agent of biological warfare. So things that we see as purely defensive, as purely, you know, for the good of humanity, um, our adversaries may still perceive as being dual use research. Um, and that could include things like novel antibiotics, um, it could include other ways of protecting our soldiers against um, adverse conditions, things like gene transfers or the adapter program um, that that is, you know, again, as we will see this as purely, uh, you know, defensive and just making our soldiers a little bit better, that will be seen um, on, on the other side as being, uh, you know, an offensive program. Um, and by the way, you can imagine versions of these programs um, that are much more uh, aggressive than what we've talked about, right? We're we're talking about melatonin. We're not talking about giving people agents that um, you know make them more aggressive as war fighters. Um, but that also could be a use of these types of technologies. Um, I'll also say there are um, types of research that. Um, are objected to as um, in the framing of dual use research, but where the the objection is primarily a moral objection. So some of the research on stem cells or on cloning, um, some of that is about dual use, um, that there could be you know a dangerous offensive capability that's being created. But some of it is also seated in um, moral objections to research using stem cells per se. Um, and there have been examples of research that is broadly seen as um, positive, but where certain um, groups will see that research as being very objectionable. Um, so for example, uh, looking at the genome of the HeLa cell, a, a cell a cell line that is widely used in research um, and where the genome for the entire HeLa, uh, the entire HeLa genome um, was published and the family of Henrietta Lacks uh, objected to this because that's their genome. So that is, again, not exactly in the normal framing of dual use research, but that is research that is intended to have a positive effect and inadvertently also carries a negative uh, a negative effect. There are important values at stake in thinking about dual use research. After all, this research does have positive benefit. And uh, much of what we um, talk about when we're talking about the regulation of dual use research starts pretty quickly to sound like um, you are telling researchers what they can and cannot do research on, or you're asking them if they do research in that area, not to share what they have found 
And that is in a very fundamental sense, um, in opposition to the core values of biomedical research and science. Um, it is openness and transparency and the willingness to share within the scientific community that really has gotten us to where we are today in terms of scientific advances. And scientists, both as individuals and as members of a community, really take seriously um, the value of being able to sit together across national lines um, and, sh and share what we have learned in the hope that this is a model for how the, we'd like the world to, um, to work, that, that we should be seeking out discoveries that are for the common good, that benefit our community and also um, communities outside, even up to and including uh, our enemies. Um, and we do even, you know, during the Cold War, there were programs where um, Soviet scientists and, and American scientists worked productively together on research. So there is a core value or, or set of values within science that uh, values transparency and that values collaboration uh, as being and, and bringing together people from, you know, different perspectives and viewpoints, um, because that actually makes for better science. And yet, um, and none of this will come as a shock to this audience, um, the availability of knowledge and the tools of science right down to the individual uh, level in the sense that, you know, citizen science and people doing experiments in their garage um, it is, is increasingly um, scary uh, to many people. And it is, of course, the case that not everyone will hold core principles of beneficence and do no harm in the same regard. There will be people who might use um, knowledge and tools that are developed for um, beneficent purposes in a nefarious way. On top of that, of course, there is the potential for accidental um, releases, say, from a BSL-4 lab. Um, and in the last you know, number of years, we have seen prominent examples of both nefarious use, the, the use of anthrax in the US in 2001 uh, is a very prominent example of someone who you know, took uh, a lab grade anthrax, uh, aerosolizable almost grade of anthrax had used it to poison and kill um, a number of people in the United States. And as I mentioned before, we've also seen accidental misuses like the HeLa genome, where the researchers did not intend to harm Henrietta Lacks's family, but did so inadvertently. And of course, um, you know, you, you can't talk about dual use and the potential for accidents without at least mentioning the widespread uh, continuing um, you know, public fear and debate about the so-called lab leak um, hypothesis for the COVID pandemic. And there is this notion underlying all of this also in terms of the nefarious uses of sort of technological determinism, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say, if a technology is developed that has a nefarious use, um, eventually, someone will use it that way because human beings being who they are, um, an evil person will come along, right? So that's the, the idea that anything we develop, someone's going to try and use it in a bad way. And this leaves us with a set of both governance challenges and communication challenges about research. Um, you know, should some research be prohibited or as Intamin and DeMello Martin put it, should scientists be left alone? Um, and the reality, of course, is that scientists are not left alone right now today. Uh, we have multiple value-based constraints on the science that we can do. Um, some of those are constrained by law, but many of them are constrained by mechanisms of self-regulation. And so the real question here is not, should scientists be completely left alone? Of course, scientists do things that have value uh, and ethical and legal implications. So you need to have other folks at the table. The question is, who gets to decide? What are the criteria that go in? What's the process? And I, I put up a couple of the frameworks that have come out in the last few years around um, guiding funding decisions about proposed research. And the WHO guidance just came out in September, uh, the one on the left here. And I'll give you the citations for this, for these at the end. Um, and I'll just, you know, mention that 
There are many, many examples in which we constrain or limit the types of research that can take place already today. Um, so it's really not in debate whether scientists can ever be told, you know, you may not do that type of research that's either illegal or your IRB is not going to allow it, um, or you can't get funding for it. Um, and that's going to preclude you from being able to do that, you know, the research that maybe you would like to do. Um, these mechanisms of, um, of maintaining the value base of, um, of scientific progress are not always coordinated. They're not always applied equitably, um, certainly not internationally. There are not necessarily shared standards all the time that are applied you know, in every country in the same way. They have typically also, at least over the last 20 years, really focused on the governance of bio risks rather than framing this as a risk benefit assessment. And in terms of US government guidance, it's, um, you know, for better and for worse, it's been oriented around 15 known pathogens and seven types of experiments, uh, what they call phenotype experiments. So these are things like gene drive uh, experiments um, and uh, and experiments that uh, that increase the pathogenicity of an agent, for example. So there's a, a limited set of things that are being looked at um, across the board in the US at least. And then the second aspect I wanted to just mention is if you do research and you end up coming up with data that is potentially uh, has dual use uh, capability, um, how should that be shared? Are there data that shouldn't just be published in the regular peer review literature? And there are some mechanisms for oversight here in the US. There's um, there's the NSABB, which is a US government uh, agency or bo advisory board, essentially, that will look at potential dual use research and give some guidance on how to publish it. Um, that's, of course, not applicable in the private sector. It certainly doesn't touch do-it-yourself researchers in their garages. Um, but I will say it's been quite rare um, for these mechanisms to actually end up withholding communication uh, about um, novel um, science. Um, there is uh, There are U.S. export controls. Um, these are limited in the sense that they are um, limited by the definition of what's called fundamental or basic research, um, which leaves us with the question about, okay, so if the U.S. government, if regulatory agencies are not going to constrain what gets published, should journals and journal editors come together? And there have been efforts in that regard to apply a set of standards for how journals should review and uh, make decisions about publication when they're looking at a paper that has potential for dual use. Um, there is not really a broad international comprehensive uh, mm -hmm. guidance at the moment, although um, there has been you know, talk about uh, developing that for, gosh, 20 years now. There are a number of problems with any of these efforts to uh, forbidding science or science communication, as Marchant and Pope put it back in 2009, uh, when this issue was also getting a lot of attention because of the uh, H1N1 pandemic. Um, there is, you know, and I've just listed a few of these here, uh, which I won't go into for uh, purposes of uh, saving us a little time for conversation, but there are some obvious reasons why um, laws are not always the best way to uh, constrain individual and group behaviors, which leaves us with this final question about, okay, so if laws and governmental regulation is not the best approach, um, is scientific self-regulation possible that would allow us to mitigate the risk while also obtaining benefits? Um, and what would this look like um, in the in the sense of, you know, how do we either use existing mechanisms like IRBs um, to include an assessment of dual use? Is that the right mechanism or place for that conversation to take place? Are there other places in the self-regulatory environment of science um, in terms of the culture of science and the sort of codes of ethics of science and so on. Is it possible for us to do something, you know, like took place at the Asilomar conference on recombinant DNA back in 1975 that effectively constrained but did not stop 
um, DNA, uh, recombinant DNA uh, research? Um, and how would uh, things like that work? And again, I'll, I'll just say there are examples of science regulating itself. Um, there ha there's the Asilomar conference, of course, but there's also been, you know, largely successful, but not entirely, um, a, a prohibition on human cloning that has held um, for, you know, a long time until very recently in China. And I will say the people who did that are, um, you know, suffered very serious repercussions. So, um, so I think the the prohibition on cloning of human beings ha has largely held, um, and it is not a, a prohibition that is all entirely in law. It is mostly a prohibition that has been self imposed within the scientific community. So I'll just uh, leave you with these, and if if anyone would like to uh, to see the slide deck, I'm happy to share it. Well, thank you so much, Matt, uh, for that really sensitive uh, perspective on um, what we can do. I, I guess I, I once gave a seminar on, uh, you know, what can we innovate? And, you know, is the sky the limit? Um, mm -hmm. What's your perspective as we go around the table now? Uh, and thank you also, Max and Sarah, for that wonderful introduction into your fields. Um, Matt? Uh, are there things that we shouldn't be dabbling with? How do medical professionals and medical ethicists see that kind of question? Well, I'll say the, there are um, more constraints on how we dabble than on what we dabble in, right? So um, there are lots of constraints on the types of research that can take place in the sense that you can't do research on, you know, people who are not able to consent with very limited exceptions, you know, emergency uh, type research and so on. But uh, with limited exceptions, um, there are certainly constraints on the danger level that you can put someone in. Even if they volunteer, there are certain, you know, the IRB will tell you, you, you just can't do that uh, type of experiment. It's too dangerous. Um, you have to do that on, on animals for, right there constraints on having to do animal research before you move into human research. So, you know, you can't just jump straight to, to human beings anymore. Um, so uh, there are a lot of things that came out of the Nuremberg medical trials and the declaration of Helsinki. And right, these are taken in the Belmont report and the common rule. These are constraints on how research is done. And to some extent, that means they are constraints on what research, uh, can can look at um, the constraints around uh, is there an entire basket of research that you just can't move forward um, is much less common. Um, I would say you know the recombinant DNA technology example is probably our best example, along with the cloning example, where people have said you know where where the scientific community has come together in a variety of different fora forums for a. Um, and basically said, no, you know, we're not going to clone humans right now. Uh, we've cloned sheep. There will be other things cloned. There will be chimeras formed, right? But uh, we also are not going to grow an entire human brain in a Petri dish right now, right? So there are, there are places where the scientific community has come together and said, you know, that would be too far. Um, I don't think there is to my you know to my understanding there is not currently an ongoing international forum for deliberation and establishment of norms there are multiple potential forums some of which are you know a, a little more established than others um, but i do think it would be useful um, for who un you know uh, the various journal editors um, to have an ongoing forum for explicit deliberation uh, on on some of these questions. That's a great perspective and one uh, I know I'll be looking uh, further into uh, dovetailing from this international perspective. Um, you know, Europe seems to have done quite a lot in this implantable space and very early on uh, there was an opinion piece uh, by Capuro Redota, uh, the late Redota and others uh, 
that was on ICT implants way before anyone was really thinking about them uh, in the mainstream uh, in terms of academia. And Raphael, of course, uh, resides in Germany, still alive and uh, doing amazingly uh, wonderful research, continued research in this space. And he talked uh, with Redota uh, a lot about proportionality and Max, this risk versus reward or cost benefit um how do you see it playing out uh in the next number of years like who, what types of stakeholders may have differing views about risks versus rewards or costs versus benefits how do you see it who determines what's proportional well in you know in in the military as i said it's it's the responsibility of the, of the superiors going up the chain of command an interesting question when you're talking about biomedical uh, 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 interventions or research uh, is the relationship between the you know the, the 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 commander and the medical expert. So, for example, the, the unit's physician. Uh, and I had an interesting uh, discussion uh, last night uh, with Edmund Howe about uh, the you know that that poten the potential for uh, uh, you know conflict. Uh, and, how, and who ultimately calls the shots and, and the best you know sort of answer to that was uh, they're supposed to consult but you know ultimately you know it's the it's the commander who makes the decision although I gather that the physician if she disagrees with the decision mm -hmm. the commander is about to make can take it up the line uh, to you know up through the medical uh, hierarchy uh, and possibly also the non-medical hierarchy but um, uh, you know, so there's that tension. Yeah, and I'll say, uh, well, I just, so I think there's, um, that's not a uniformly accepted uh, that, the, that the commander ultimately has the final say. Um, the medical is a little like the JAGs in, in the military, uh, the, 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 the legal uh, experts are outside the typical chain of command. Um, and so, so if, you are ordered to do something that is illegal and the jag tells you it's illegal you should not follow that order and the same is roughly the case if you are told as a medical expert that you should do something that is contrary to medical ethics um you should not do that yeah do we have any historical recent historical examples of that playing out uh well, there there were people who refused force feeding of prisoners at Guantanamo, uh, and there were presumably some uh, physicians who refused to participate in the torturous interrogation of prisoners um, in during the that era in American history, that sad era. Um, none came forward. Well, only one nurse came forward. Uh, no physicians came forward and were public in their refusal but there were those who refused and were not public about it yeah that, but that sounds like you know individuals and were not punished an ethical judgment of you know for themselves i'm just wondering if there are examples of you know medical personnel right. telling you know non-medical personnel about that you know you can't do this and, and what happened. uh it's not so much that the medical personnel would tell the non-medical personnel what to do it's if the medical personnel are ordered to do something that is contrary to medical ethics um, they are the expert in medical ethics, not the commanding officer. Um, and so if in the same way that uh, a lawyer is the expert in the law, um, the, the commanding officer can't. And similarly, by the way, it's not just ethics. If the commanding officer says, I want you to do this procedure on that patient, on that soldier, um, and you think that's the wrong medical procedure, you you are not under the obligation to do medicine that is the wrong medicine because the commanding officer told you to do it. Sarah, um, again, uh, going off uh, Max and Matt's discussion uh, just now, um, tell us about how a soldier navigates um, both military law and civilian law, but we've got state-based anti-chipping laws uh, for forced uh, implantation uh, by doctors, by uh, employers, by parents, uh, and these are set out in uh, states like California, North Dakota, Wisconsin, 
um, Ohio, and the list goes on. Uh, there are probably in 2009, there were nine uh, state laws that I investigated uh, that had been passed in terms of bills right through to legislation. How does, an, you know, if I'm at home and I'm a soldier, uh, you know, there's something different applied to when I'm out in the field. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. Um, so if we're just looking at privacy, getting a, a little complicated because uh, on the one hand, in general, like HIPAA and the and the other privacy laws are also uh, being uh, applicable to uh, uh, the military. Yeah, so if it's like a clinical um, a military hospital, that's a covered entity. But then, in addition, we do have some exceptions. So, for example, HIPAA does have a military command exception. So, a commander can, under specific conditions. Uh, actually, um, the the inform the um, the protected health information can be disclosed to the commander, uh, for example, for activities that are necessary in a, in a military mission. And so we do have specific um, provisions that are specifically uh, uh, applicable to um, uh, to the military, um, also uh, for veterans. Uh, so there are also the Privacy Act of 1974 that gives some protection. Um, and so uh, we do have, um, uh, so I, I, I think how you can see it is in general, we do have for individuals and uh, any individual uh, privacy laws, but then one needs to be very careful when one is in the context of, um, uh, of uh, uh, war fighters, because um, whether that's informed consent, whether that's a treatment, whether that's privacy, there are always some exceptions based on the fact that um, it's, a, uh, it's a different environment. And so um, one, uh, um, one needs to um, look at these uh, specific exceptions when one is in the military context. But in general, uh, all the other privacy laws in general still apply, but there may be exceptions to soldiers. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, we're going to go to questions. There's a lot happening in the chat. 